While we all quietly surf around on the internet, an elite of the smartest hackers scans it day and night looking for undetected safety leaks. They convert these secret leaks as if by magic into building blocks for cyber weapons, which they sell for astronomical amounts of money to criminal organizations, but also to security services and cyber armies, enabling them to infiltrate unnoticed into your computer, banks, or even nuclear plants. Among hackers, there is a gold rush for these lucrative safety leaks, and they call this gold Zero Days. This is what you are about to see. If 10 years ago somebody would have told me that by 2014, it will be commonplace and normal for Western democratic governments to write viruses and Trojans and backdoors, that would have sounded like science fiction. Normally, when you talk about gray and black markets, you're talking about what's legal or illegal. All of this is currently legal. So vulnerability and exploit sales, it's all currently legal. In 2007 or 8 or so, I sold a bug to the U.S. government uh, for something around fifty dollars or $80,000. This is VPRO's Backlight. Welcome to cyberspace. For many years, we have admired cyberspace as a magical new world. Enchanted as we were by its infinite online opportunities, we didn't trouble ourselves much about our virtual safety. While most of us are awakening from that dream thanks to Snowden's revelations, a small online community kept its head over the past 20 years and paid close attention when our digital infrastructure began to develop. A golden age has now begun for hackers who search the internet for zero days, mysterious security leaks that form the raw materials for cyber weapons. On the eve of the biggest hacking conference in the world, DEF CON in Las Vegas, Hackers, who enjoy shooting as a hobby, meet in the desert. RSO, is it, is it clear? Cyber weapons can steal technology, divert politics, get your privacy, learn things about you that they shouldn't know right now. As the Internet of Things, to use that term, gets more and more common, the reality of this kind of thing and computer security in general may invade into the physical world. So when we talk about smart cars or linked up cars that have drive-by wire systems, braking systems, if they don't do it right, they don't segregate those systems or those things are linked in, the, the reality of guns being able to kill and cyber weapons being able to kill converge. And I think that we're getting closer and closer to that reality. By now, we are aware that our personal data, bank information and online privacy are not entirely safe. But can our physical safety also be hacked in the future? How big is the gap between real guns and hackers who pull the trigger online? Inside the hat, there's a Wi-Fi router, and uh, if you can log on to the Wi-Fi router and load any web page, it gives you a scoreboard and a list of 40 usernames and password hashes. If you can crack any one of those, you can get on the scoreboard, and you can make the hat say anything that you want. DEF CON's the largest hacker conference in the world. Uh, this is its 22nd year. I think they're expecting 20,000 people this year, and it's a collection of hackers that are good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, I know a lot of people think hackers are uh, a menace, but most of us are white hats. In other words, we use our talents and our curiosity and our technical skills to make the world a safer place. 
Joshua Corman is a pioneer within the hacking community. He founded I Am The Cavalry, a movement that tries to motivate hackers to use their talents to make software safer. I think this culturally is a, an early bellwether of where society is going because it's the, it's the mashup of uh, fringe culture, technology, and society that show where we're having a bigger impact on geopolitics, on public policy, on safety and things like medical devices, our cars, our homes, our public infrastructure. And what we once did as a hobby is now uh, a critical part of society. And we're only now just figuring this out and we're starting to act and rise to that sacred responsibility. Hacking is a form of power. And this new form of power has been solely in the domain of the hacking community for quite some time. They were the early magicians, the early wizards, uh, without really much motivation to use their, their talents politically or for anything. The first generation of hackers has come of age. They used to be harmless nerds, but now they're able to completely disrupt society. In the late 1980s, they developed their talents by writing the first malware, software that took over your operating system in an amusing manner. This malware was clearly visible and harmless because it would be gone when you restarted your computer. Now, 25 years later, our entire society is connected to the internet. Water, energy and industrial networks all have an IP address which makes them accessible to hackers. Online safety and physical safety, traditionally separate domains, are slowly beginning to converge. And for the first time ever, malware can now have disastrous consequences. Our entire power supply can be cut off. Our systems can be taken over. Hospitals deprived of power would cease to function. It's not if, it's when. Je merkt wel dat die digitalisering van al die van die kritische infrastructuur, dat gaat ontzettend snel. En de vraag is of de, de mate van hoe we in staat zijn dat veilig te houden in hetzelfde tempo meegaat. Ronald Prince is a cryptographer sometimes described as the most powerful nerd in the Netherlands. His company, Fox IT, provides security for the sensitive information of large companies and encrypts the state secrets of the Dutch government. Het internet is nou gewoon ook de backbone van onze economie geworden zo'n beetje in Nederland. Als het, als het internet in Nederland niet werkt, dan uh, stopt echt alles. Hè? Dan worden de, de, de winkels niet meer bevoorraad, dan liggen, zijn de snelwegen vol met files, want dan werken de snelheidssignaleringen niet meer op de weg en zo. En dat is afhankelijk van een paar hele cruciale knooppunten die we hebben. En uh, die moeten vooral wel blijven draaien, want anders gaan er dingen mis. En het, mijn grootste angst is eigenlijk dat we niet eens doorhebben hoe relevant dat internet voor ons is in ons normale leven. We weten niet van welk stukje van het internet of welke browser of welk Windows platform overal gebruikt wordt. En als uh, ergens in die hele lange keten om te zorgen dat het blijft werken één zo'n schakeltje omvalt, ja, dan zitten er heel veel dingen aan vast. En we kunnen geen grote kaart maken waar we dat netjes op kunnen aanwijzen. Van als dit misgaat, dan weet ik zeker dat dit ook misgaat. Niemand heeft dat totaal overzicht. Nee, en dat gaan we niet krijgen ook. En, 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 en je ziet dus in die, in die oude wereld zitten we heel erg van... Um, laten we proberen zo'n kaart te bouwen, APK erop en dan gaan we alles testen af en toe en dan zal het wel goed zijn. Terwijl het een heel dynamische omgeving is natuurlijk. Die kaart is geen, geen moment hetzelfde. Je moet dus een hele andere structuur bouwen om... Uh, je moet ook niet naar, niet, niet naar absolute security misschien streven, je moet naar, naar uh, weerbaarheid streven. Waarbij je accepteert dat dingen misgaan. Uh, je weet niet eens wat, maar dat dat dus geen grote keteneffecten zou moeten kunnen hebben. Vanmorgen hadden we een klikfraudebordje. En uh, die, zien we, die hebben we de afgelopen week hebben we die ook nog twee keer lang zien komen. Wel bij verschillende klanten overigens. Dus dat is dan wel weer uh, een vrij rap uh, opvolging aangegeven. En afgelopen vrijdag hebben we... Young hackers guard the internet and try to detect the truly dangerous malware among the thousands of irregularities. There is no perfect security. If I could provide you with 100% security, I would. But I can't, 
so I won. Mikko Hyppinen is a famous Finnish antivirus expert who travels all over the globe trying to combat malware. When I started analyzing viruses, it was all just kids writing them for fun. They weren't really getting anything out of it. It was just a challenge. Around 2003, 2004, we started seeing the first money-making malware, and that's initially just spammers using botnets to send their spam. So they were starting cooperating with malware writers. And that's when these hobbyists started realizing that they can actually use their skills to make money. And we started seeing this shift of hobbyists starting cooperating with spammers and other online criminals. And in a couple of years, the hobbyists just disappeared. We don't really see them at all anymore. All the malware we see today is written by criminals or hacktivist gangs or by governments themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a warm welcome. Mikko Hyppinen. Thank you for being here today to speak about governments as malware authors. If 10 years ago somebody would have told me that Western democratic governments will create offensive malware and deploy it against other democratic Western friendly governments, that would have sounded like science fiction. Yet that's exactly what's happening today. For example, UK intelligence launching offensive malware attacks against Belgian telcos, which happened. We probably wouldn't have guessed how active governments would have become by 2014 writing active offensive malware for computers and phones and tablets that we use all the time. A real-time visualization of the biggest malware attacks happening in cyberspace. A world war fought with ones and zeros. As long as we assume that these attacks have no physical consequences, maps like these look like a computer game. But in 2010, it became clear that some of these colored lines can be powerful weapons with consequences in the real world. In June last year, a computer virus called Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the databanks of power plants, traffic control systems and factories around the world. 20 times more complex than any previous virus code, it had an array of capabilities. Among them, the ability to turn up the pressure inside nuclear reactors or switch off oil pipelines. And Stuxnet could tell the system operators everything was normal. What was it looking to shut down? the centrifuges that spin nuclear material at Iran's enrichment facilities. Stuxnet was a weapon, the first to be made entirely out of code. A cyberweapon is a stuk, uh, stukje malware, a stukje software waarmee je kwaadaardig uh, iets in een ander systeem uh, kunt doen. En, maar het bestaat uit meer dan alleen de software, want het gaat ook om de wijze waarop je die malware in het systeem brengt waar je, uh, wat je wil verstoren. Het gaat erom welke kwetsbaarheid je gebruik maakt en het gaat erom dat je ook het kunt, uh, kunt sturen. Last year, the Dutch army started to train cyber soldiers in order to be able to defend and attack in cyberspace. Goedemorgen heren. Afgelopen 2,5 jaar zijn we met de taskforce aan de gang gegaan om uh, cyber een plaats te geven binnen Defensie. We zijn uh, begonnen met het uh, versterken van onze defensieve capaciteit, onze bescherming. En we zijn nu gericht op het uh, verder implementeren van offensieve cyber. In het kader van een militaire operatie daadwerkelijk verstoren of beïnvloeden of vernietigen van vijandelijke digitale middelen met gebruikmaking van onze eigen digitale middelen. Om uiteindelijk een effect in de regering... Wat is de definitie die binnen Defensie wordt gehanteerd als we het hebben over cyberoorlog? Nou, wij, eh, kijk, wij, wij treden sowieso altijd op in, uh, in een gemeenschappelijk verband, land, lucht, zee uh, en, en cyber maakt daar onderdeel van uit. Dus, dus een zuivere cyberoorlog zien we niet, niet, niet gebeuren. Uh, 
Als je praat over wanneer zouden wij uh, iets als een cyberaanval uh, kenmerken... dan moet dat daadwerkelijk vergelijkbaar zijn met een gewapende aanval. Een conventioneel gewapende aanval. Dat betekent dat er uh, sprake moet zijn van, uh, uh, van daadwerkelijke fysieke schade... Uh, slachtoffers uh, en, en ontwrichting van de samenleving. Op dat moment praat je over een, over een gewapende aanval. En dat zou dan een reactie uh, rechtvaardigen. We may not have seen a real cyberwar yet, but it's not unthinkable that one may occur in the near future. Critical infrastructure is exposed, so if you wanted to shut off the power in a city or if you wanted to cause traffic mayhem. Uh, you can have damage like you saw with the uh, centrifuges in the Iranian uh, facility through Stuxnet. Um, it's not going to have the same blast as a nuclear weapon. That would be a, a horrible false equivalence. But it's so pervasively deployed that one can disrupt uh, those things. The bottom line is we are putting so much vulnerable, hackable, connected technology into so many places that this makes us prone to the willpower of any potential adversary or foe. The nature of this domain, the nature of cyber, so to speak, uh, is offense is really easy, really easy, and defense is really hard. So if you were in a sporting event where you could score a lot of goals, but you couldn't defend many goals, think, you know, World Cup, but with a very high score, it's your biological prerogative, it's your imperative to get really, really good at scoring goals. So I, I'm looking at this less moralistically, and just the nature of that battlefield favors offense. It's abstracted, right, from the reality of what it is. It's a lot different than Gosh, just 70 years ago when a pilot was doing his thing, he was seeing what he was doing, right? Or if you were a, a soldier on the ground firing a rifle, you're pretty much seeing what you're engaging, to a degree. Um, but with um, it's changing in the, in the physical realm, but in the cyber world too. I mean, you don't know, we don't know what's out there. Flame as malware, the flame malware that affected Windows, that went for five years undetected. What's going undetected now? I can't answer that. I, I, we don't know. It's undetected. Cyberspace is like the Wild West, with malware roaming around undetected. This invisible evil can damage our computers undisturbed because they are full of security leaks. Top hackers look for undetected security leaks. Zero days. Extremely valuable security leaks that have been known for zero days, meaning that not a single security person will yet know of their existence. Hackers can exploit zero days as if they were digital pass keys, giving them access to your computer or your bank or even to a nuclear power station without anyone noticing. Once inside, they can install any malware they like without alerting the system. It is estimated that Stuxnet, the attack on Iranian nuclear centrifuges, used as many as 20 zero day exploits. Op het moment dat je een, een lek vindt uh, en je bent in staat om daar een stukje exploitcode, dus een stukje software bij te schrijven wat dat lek uit kan buiten, ja, dan heb je afhankelijk van de software die je uit kan buiten wel een machtig wapen in handen. Als dat bekende software is, zoals Internet Explorer, Firefox of PDF Reader, een stukje software wat iedereen gebruikt, ja, dan heb je een machtig wapen als je dus in kunt breken op computers die die software daar hebben staan. En er wordt door verschillende hackers ook heel verschillend gedacht over hoe je met dat soort informatie om moet gaan. Moet je dat soort informatie meteen wereldkundig maken zodat iedereen weet dat het bestaat? Uh, of moet je eerst de fabrikant uh, ja, inlichten zodat hij de kans krijgt om het te fixen? Of moet je voor je eigen gewin gaan en dat is een stukje exploitcode verkopen aan, aan degene die dat willen kopen? Je hebt een heleboel hackers die daar heel verschillend mee omgaan. Back in the beginning, security researchers could only uh, ever expect you know, an acknowledgement or credit from the vendor for finding a vulnerability and reporting it to them and letting the vendor fix it. Um, and that credit actually was a form of currency. That recognition was something that security researchers could use to leverage to build a career and, and get money that way. And then it became replaced by direct monetary compensation for bugs. We, we know that software is always 
going to have vulnerabilities. As long as humans write code, there will be flaws in code. So uh, when I look at the, the vulnerability and exploit market, I look at it in terms of white, gray, and black market. And normally when you talk about gray and black markets, you're talking about what's legal or illegal. All of this is currently legal. So vulnerability and exploit sales is all currently legal. So white market, they buy vulnerabilities in order to use them for defensive purposes. Typically, it's either the vendor themselves paying for it or a broker who will share it with the vendor at no cost to try and get it fixed, to try and protect people. That's white market. And the prices are typically lower you know, than the other two markets. Gray market can be mixed use. So some of the stuff is, is sold as vulnerability information services. Some of the stuff is sold uh, as you know, ready-made exploit kits what we call weaponized exploits, right? And those are obviously going to be used for attack. And then the black market, solely for offensive purposes. And those pay the highest prices. Do you guys want to talk about exploit sales? No. Let's, no. let's, keep, it up. let's keep it up with exploit sales, man. Why, exploit you want to buy some? <laughs> yeah, where, where do I buy some, man? Let, let's start with that. Like, where, where do you buy some exploits, man? eBay. eBay? <laughs> No, I'm actually not going to talk about exploit sales at all. So. Why not? Because <laughs> we lack an idiot. Uh, white, gray, black, that's all, all uh, here in the same room? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Hacker Katie Musuris is an important player on the white market for zero-day exploits. She works for Hacker One, where white hat hackers can register their exploits in exchange for prize money so-called bug bounties, which have lately risen to serious amounts of money. Internet companies hope thus to keep white hat hackers on the straight and narrow, making the internet safer. One successful young white hat hacker is 17-year-old Oliver Begg. He made thousands of dollars by finding zero days for Yahoo!, Oliver also hacks Dutch banks with some regularity, and he hacked the Dutch tax office. I think out of interest for gewoon computers. And then programmeren. And from that programmeren ook lekker vind in code. And that, yeah, so it's begun. And how have you programmeren geleerd? Kijken naar andere code, vooral. And then documentaties bekijken, programmeer talen. And then leer je vanzelf. Hoe, hoe wat moet. En heel veel talen lijken best wel op elkaar. Dus dan kun je er gelijk ook meerdere en zo kun je het uitbouwen. Dat is heel handig. En is zeg maar het vinden van lekken, is dat hetzelfde als programmeren of is het een soort van andere skill? Mm, het is nadenken wat een programmeur vergeten kan zijn. Dus je moet programmeerkennis hebben. Wil je verder kunnen dan alleen gewoon testen op standaard dingetjes? Denk ik. Maar je, je kunt heel diep gaan met programmeerkennis. One site had an online shopping basket with a discount coupon. Oliver detected a zero day in the underlying code and discovered a faulty input which reduced his bill to no dollars at all. He could have shopped for free, but instead he sent this video clip to Yahoo to help them resolve this vulnerability. En dit filmpje heb jij gemaakt om Yahoo te laten zien dat er een lek zat in hun uh, systeem? Ja. Klopt. En al op het idee komen om die dingen in te voeren, waar heb je dat vandaan? Dat is gewoon uh, boeken. Ik heb hier een boek, bijvoorbeeld. Kijk. Er staan allemaal type vulnerabilities en uitgelegd, dus kwetsbaarheden. Even kijken. Hier heb je hem uitgelegd. Dus selecteer iets van gebruikers waar de gebruikersnaam dit is of 1 is 1. Nou, in dit geval krijg je alle gebruikers. En wat voor boek is dit? Is het een soort hacker voor dummies of hoe heet het? De um, Web Application Hackers Handbook, tweede editie. Oliver finds zero days in big websites. For hackers, the next level is finding zero days in well-known software that everyone works with. For example, your operating system or your internet browser. 
dit is een voorbeeld wat ooit een zero-day exploit is geweest. En wat we in het grijs zien, dat is de, 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 de kern van de exploit? Of de, de... Dat is de zogenaamde payload wat hier in het grijs staat. En de payload is datgene wat uiteindelijk uitgevoerd wordt op het moment dat ik de controle over Internet Explorer over heb genomen. Als je dus echt inderdaad de analogie met een analoog wapen wil gaan maken, met een offline wapen zeg maar, dan, dan zou dit inderdaad de lading zijn, de, de, de kernkop van, van het wapen. Ik kan je stap voor stap meenemen hier, maar dan moet ik je ja, een dag lang college geven. En dan nog denk ik dat je niet alles snapt. In terms of the broad, you know, the broadest sense of those who are capable of finding, you know, some of the simpler vulnerabilities like web vulnerabilities, there are tens of thousands of those types of researchers in the world. But um, the researchers who can bypass platform-wide shields, there are probably about a thousand individuals worldwide who know how to do that kind of thing on modern operating systems and software. Um, of that thousand, there's less than half who are willing or capable of working alongside the good guys and the vendors and the defenders. So it's a very thin market, you know, when you're trying to attract those types of researchers to either work for you or, you know, in the case of white market bug bounty programs, if you're trying to attract them to, to sell their vulnerabilities and exploit techniques to you. There is a worldwide elite of an estimated 1,000 hackers that may be white hat or black hat. They mingle once a year in Las Vegas at parties sponsored by large internet companies. This is where we meet a former cryptographer of the American Intelligence Service, NSA. He hacked the first iPhone and MacBook Air. Charlie Miller, He's an authority when it comes to zero-day exploits. If I can make your computer send me an email with all your photos, like, I've won. You can't argue that I didn't do it, right? So that's what I think is fun about it, is there's no, there's no gray. Like, I've either hacked you or I haven't. And if I can do it, I can prove it to you, and then you have to listen to me. And so that's one of the reasons I like about it. But it's not as exciting as you would think, because it takes maybe a month of work and you're always getting closer and closer and closer, and at some point you know you're gonna win. You know you're gonna succeed. It's just a matter of time. And so like, when that comes, like you're happy to be done, but you knew it was coming, so it's not like, oh my God, it's not like TV where like, okay, oh, I'm in. Like, that's not how hacking works. Hacking is days and weeks of, of effort, and then eventually it all adds up and you, and you get in. Uh, there's lots of ways to find vulnerabilities in software. The, the easiest way and the way I prefer is called fuzzing. And what that means is you just send lots and lots of inputs into a program and the program should say things like, oh, that's invalid, right? Or, so you're sending invalid inputs and it says that's invalid or I can't deal with that or whatever. What it shouldn't do is just fall over dead. But if you send a lot, a lot, a lot of inputs into it, sometimes it'll fall over dead. And maybe that only happens one in a million times which is very rare, but if you're sending 100 million inputs, it happens quite a bit. And so it's just a matter of scale. So if you send enough inputs that are you know, crafted horribly, eventually the program fails, and sometimes it fails in an innocent way, but sometimes it fails in a security important way. And so you have to just buzz for a long time, you know, days, weeks, months, whatever. You just have a bunch of computers running and you wake up every day and you look at them and you're like, hey, look, nothing happened, <laughs> right? But every once in a while you're like, oh my God, look what it found. So uh, I have this funny graph I show sometimes where it shows my electricity bill. And you can see my electricity bill is a certain amount and then I turn on my fuzzers and it goes way up because I have all these computers running all the time, you know, very hard. There's a huge demand for hackers capable of finding complex zero days. They can offer their services to the white, gray or black markets. All three markets are legal. What ethics do they use in making their choice? I'm entirely fine if people want to like sell exploits to the military. But even is it misused, are the sellers or the finders or the researchers then responsible for that? Like, we sold it. But if you use it in violation of international law or if you use it, use it in violation of moral principle, how is that suddenly my fault? 
You got five minutes? Three minutes? Yeah, I got three minutes. Okay. So you want to give your name or no? Sure, I'm Dan. Okay. So Dan, uh, we're talking about hacking culture, what the motives of hacking. They originally want to talk about the ethics of, you know, should you be selling weaponized exploits to the government? What kind of changes are we making? What kind of changes should we be making? Well... You don't have to be political. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it's, 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 a, it's a scale game, right? Because on one side, you say, if I have an O-Day, I can sell this O-Day for $500,000, or I can sell it for a million dollars. When you're dealing with those sums of money, people's motives change. Because if I told you, I want you to crack into the NSA for me, here's $5, you'd say, you're retarded, go away. If I said, I want you to crack into the NSA, I have a dump truck full of gold for you, you might reconsider. You're a dump truck full of gold? I could probably get away with a lot of things if I had a dump truck full of gold. So things, things get gray very quick when you take the amount of money that people are passing back and forth into consideration. People are going to sell bugs. It doesn't matter how many people you hate for doing it or if you decide they're all evil, like you're not going to stop them by thinking they're evil. So in the same way that people will sell arms and people will kill each other as long as they want to kill each other, like bugs are going to exist, people are going to sell bugs. I mean, the way I sometimes describe the community is this is the community of people who would very willingly research nuclear fission knowing that they're going to produce the nuclear bomb because they know that fission is cool for totally other reasons. And they very much come to terms with, with that, that side of things, I suppose. How to make the majority def defend us? Well, I mean, thus far, and you walked around the halls of DEF CON, um, very few have figured out the geopolitical power they have or the role that they could play in things that, like this. The awakening hasn't happened yet. Now, they were very motivated last year, right after the Snowden leaks. They, they were very concerned about censorship and surveillance, and some of them were building new tools to have more secure and private and anonymous conversations. Um, but that's still a, the vast minority. I guess I sometimes think about this in terms of like comic books, like the mutants and the X-Men. Um, the X-Men were formed to have a positive, constructive use of their power, and Magneto formed the Brotherhood of Mutants to, to, to be the next step of evolution past humans. And without getting into too much comic book lore, um, I think one reason that I'm motivated to do I Am the Cavalry is to give a positive, constructive use of our mutant powers, so to speak, um, because the alternative could be worse. Hackers have power, and Joshua wants to use this power to the good by motivating hackers to make not only software safer, but also things like medical equipment, aeroplanes, and cars. Good morning. So really what's stuck in it with us and really works in the Beltway and with policymakers and the general public is the simple truth, the immutable truth, that our dependence on technology is growing faster than our ability to secure it. We want to ensure that uh, the technologies that potentially impact public safety and human life are worthy of trust. It doesn't mean we can go fix them, but we're going to do what we can with our power, with our talent, with our power of story and research, and by teaming with industry to, uh, to make sure that we can achieve these goals. Okay. But did you like the block, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think you'll like the bullpup too. It's it's nice. But it's pretty heavy. Um. Yeah, and it's pretty loud, but uh, it actually doesn't have much of a kick to it. It's not a hard recoil. No, it's not a very hard recoil at all. My wife fired my Glock 40, and she liked it. But then she fired a 45, and she fell in love with the 45. So she's got one a 45 already. The philosophical side is being it's computer security, there's always this arms race, right? We're, we're fighting the bad guys or the good guys, and it's not always clear which one's the good guy or the bad guy. But with technology and computers, it's the technology itself is neutral. It doesn't do anything. It's what you do with it that determines the bad or the good. Guns are no different. They're physical objects. They can launch projectiles at high speed. They can be used for good or for bad. You could defend yourself. You could hunt for food. You could do something awful, which we've seen in the news. Or you could be a government and do lots of awful things in recent history with them. But without them, you're definitely defenseless against any of it. And that means not just computers and technology and the internet, but in my opinion, guns too. Beschikt Nederland over een cyberwapenarsenaal? Hebben wij cyberwapens op de plank? Nou, een, 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 nee, er is niet een cyberwapenarsenaal wat landen hebben. Wat, uh, kijk, bij, bij digitale systemen is er sprake van een, 
uh, een, een hoeveelheid software, een hoeveelheid eentjes en nulletjes. En in die eentjes en nulletjes, in die, in die software, daar zitten kwetsbaarheden in. Op een, een of andere manier is die beveiliging niet in orde. Als jij dat wil, uh, daar gebruik van wil maken... dan zul je dus informatie moeten hebben over wat dat systeem is dat je wil aanvallen. Ja, ja, maar is het zo, want we hebben het dan over de term zero days, toch? Je hebt die zero days te lekken. Zero days is, zijn kwetsbaarheden die wel ontdekt zijn, maar nog niet verholpen zijn. Dus dat zou de eerste stap zijn naar dat cyberwapen? Zou de eerste stap, ja. Beschikt Nederland over dat soort zero days? Daar doe ik verder geen uitspraak over. En is dat omdat... Um... Ja, want van andere landen is bekend, of daar lezen wij nu veel over, dat ze, dat ze daarover beschikken. En ook dat er een handel is in, in, in zero days. Maar ze zijn nodig voor uh, zero nou, als, days. Als jij, als jij een systeem wil aanvallen waarvan geen kwetsbaar, waarvan je de inlichtingen hebt dat, daar, uh, dat er geen bekende kwetsbaarheden zijn, dan zul je dus gebruik moeten maken van onbekende kwetsbaarheid. En dat zijn zogenaamde zero days. Maar zero days, die zij hebben ook maar een beperkte uh, levensduur. Want op enig moment wordt dat systeem gepatcht, wordt het systeem geüpdate en dan uh, heb je dat niet meer ter beschikking. Nee, maar het is dus wel zeer waarschijnlijk dat Nederland daar wel beschikking over heeft. Of althans wil onze defensie kunnen... Nou ja, uh, op... wil, wil je op bepaalde systemen uh, kunnen aanvallen, dan zul je van uh, onbekende kwetsbaarheden gebruik moeten maken. Ja. Zero days are controversial building blocks used by ministries of defense and intelligence services to install monitoring software and build cyber weapons. There is a curious paradox in cyberspace. For a safer world, security leaks are used that keep our software unsafe. So one thing the governmental malware writing has created, has created a market for vulnerabilities and exploits and zero days. Because the governmental attackers need a way to jump from the net to the target systems. And since they are unable to create enough uh, exploits by themselves, they are outsourcing that exploit development to other parties, third parties, including defense contractors, but also these small boutique companies that do nothing else than create vulnerabilities or find vulnerabilities and create exploits for them, weaponize those exploits and then sell them to different governments. How big is this industry? Nobody knows for sure how big it is. It's clearly in the tens of millions globally every year. We, we know that just by looking at their price lists, some of which we have. This is an exploit subscription service where they guarantee to you at least 25 zero days a year at the price of two and a half million. That's a good deal, I'm sure. A worldwide IT security industry meets the needs of governments to control the digital domain. It supplies complex products in which zero days play an important role. One of the most controversial businesses is Vupen, a French company that openly conducts a trade in zero day exploits. There's no guarantee that once you sell the exploit, it's only being used for certain things. I mean, that doesn't worry you. Well, it doesn't worry me because it's not true. Exploits do not kill. Computers do not kill. Uh, if a repressive regime wants to kill people, they have old school methods. So they don't need zero day exploits. So I worked for the NSA for five years back 2000, 2005. And even though I really have no idea what's going on there anymore, I can't really talk about governments and exploits and that sort of thing. Okay. You signed for that, or? What's that? You signed for that, not talking about that. Or well, not specifically that, but I can't talk about anything that has even closely related to what I did when I worked in the NSA. Yeah, okay. But have you sold to government or to... What's that? Have you, have you sold to government? Yes. In 2007 or 8 or so, I sold a bug to the U.S. government uh, for something around $50,000 or $80,000. And I wrote a paper about it because I thought... Like now everyone kind of knows that that happens, but at the time no one talked about it. And so for me, I thought it was important to sort of get it out in the open that like, hey, there's this issue where like people are finding bugs and selling them and making money, but they're not getting fixed. And so I wanted to at least get that out there. So I wrote this paper about it and talked to all about every, all the processes I went through and you know, the bug and like how it didn't get fixed for a long time and all this kind of stuff. What is your opinion then on companies, companies being regarded as controversial, like Fupan? 
end game, uh, all in that market. How do you do? Do you have an ethical standpoint uh, about that, or you just? Not really. I mean, I think if we want to put Vupan out of business, what we need to do is make secure software, right? If if they can't hack our stuff, they can't sell anything. And so, Vupen is a distraction. Don't worry about them. They're going to do their thing. But if we do our job, writing secure software, we'll put them out of business just naturally. So let's let's focus on that. One simple solution for all online threats would be to manufacture truly safe software. We try to achieve this by constantly updating our smartphones, tablets, and computers. Although the authorities encourage this, such security updates also pose a problem to them, because truly safe software inevitably means a loss of detection possibilities. In order to enable nations to hack, some security companies play a cat and mouse game with the big software suppliers. You have new challenges today. Sensitive data is transmitted over encrypted channels. Often the information you want is not transmitted at all. Your target may be outside your monitoring domain. Is passive monitoring enough? You need more. You want to look through your target's eyes. You have to hack your target. Let's say the device is a, uh, a computer. You'd be able to uh, see all of the keystrokes you know, that uh, the uh, operator uh, used. You'd be able to go into their uh, memory, find out what do documents were stored there, what information is available on that machine. If they used uh, Skype, you'd be able to monitor that call. You'd be able to turn on the camera or the microphone when the subject was unaware of it and hear and see what was going on in front of the computer. All of those kinds of capabilities. So it's, it's quite, I mean, it's a very powerful system. And uh, as I say, I recognize that a lot of people find that to be perhaps uh, frightening, but it's also a capability that's available from uh, other to, to the bad guys. <laughs> you know, it can be done not just by us. It's available on uh, various you know black internet sites that uh, provide these kinds of capabilities to uh, criminals and terrorists. And if it's installed on my device, I will not find find out. Um, that's certainly the objective of hacking team, to make sure that whoever is using, uh, is the subject of the investigation, is unaware that it's being used against them. In addition to surveillance software that operates invisibly on your computer, the IT security industry also offers fuzzers to governments, expensive software that can trace zero days automatically, while your antivirus software gropes around in the dark. As a consumer, I think I make my software secure by using an antivirus program. Yeah. What's the difference with, with such a program? I mean, well, antivirus uh, programs, they try to stop known vulnerabilities. Well, if I'm a hacker and I don't want to be discovered, I'm not going to use a known vulnerability. I'm going to use an unknown vulnerability and write an exploit. So we find the stuff the hackers use to find unknown vulnerabilities and write zero-day exploits that nobody knows about until somebody finds them. You have a sort of ethical code to who you sell? Yeah, I mean, we sell to large companies, uh, governments, militaries that want to protect their command and control networks, critical infrastructure. So we just don't sell to some random hacker that, you know, tries to come to us. So we vet the customers, but most of them are very large organizations. But I mean, could military or intelligence use your product to, to, to develop offensive uh, products? But they could. I mean, the stuff we find is really the raw material of uh, cyber weapons. If I want to buy the full package, what are we talking about? I mean, if you want to buy all the stuff we have uh, to test everything, you're probably talking 2 million euros. Around a little plus or minus, probably a little more plus. For a thought, but uh, one thing I couldn't see as a use case. We are in the middle of cyber arms race. Any military that ha has any kind of capability is right now stockpiling capability for launching cyber attacks in case they need that in future crises. And it, in that sense, we are in the middle of cyber cold war, if you will. I don't think the internet can be controlled. 
and I fear that the attempt to do so will only make things worse. You're here at DEF CON, the largest hacker conference in the world, and no matter what people do to try to control it, there will always be a way to undermine it. The Minister of Security and Justice in the Netherlands, Mr. Ivo Obstelten. Minister. Dutch society must be able to enjoy the full benefits of the digital age safely. We need to collaborate. Only together with our partners, we can ensure that the Netherlands is safe and remains safe, offline and online. Kan de overheid ons nog wel beveiligen in cyber of ligt uh, ons lot misschien in de handen van uh, jonge ethische hackers? Nou ja, dat is, uh, ik weet dus niet waar het op uitkomt. Ja, als de, waar traditioneel de overheid zorgde voor onze veiligheid in, in het fysieke domein, vraag ik me af of ze ooit in staat zullen zijn dat in het digitale domein te doen. En je kunt ook op een andere manier het begrip van een situatie proberen te verstoren. Als burger, waar kun je inderdaad je veiligheid verwachten als het gaat om cyber? Kunnen we dat nog van Defensie verwachten? Kan ik dat van u verwachten en van Defensie? Nou, Defensie is niet de digitale brandweer van Nederland. Defensie is niet verantwoordelijk voor de beveiliging van uh, uw smartphone of uw, uh, uw laptop. En daar bent u echt zelf voor verantwoordelijk. Elke Nederlander dus moet zelf zorgen dat hij in zijn eigen digitale omgeving vrij en veilig kan, uh, kan opereren. The conversation needs to start to turn to what's the role of government in protecting its citizens. Things could get very ugly very quickly. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm trying to advance, focus on, not on the, the weapons or the zero days or the techniques or offense or defense, but the, the, the bigger picture of what should the new social contract be. Cyberspace has no clean boundaries, no clean jurisdictions, and probably never will. It's an existential threat to the nation state. Nations are fighting for control of cyberspace, making large scale investments in surveillance and cyber weapons. What role do we want our governments to play online if at the same time they have a vested interest in security leaks? And how can we, as citizens, organize our own cyber security. So we need you to help out. We need you to understand that it isn't all about, you know, building the coolest tool. It's sometimes about building the coolest tool and helping other people out. Or building the coolest tool and understanding that, hey, this neat thing that gives us privacy or that neat, awesome new uh, encryption platform, it not only lets us, you know, encrypt our emails with each other, but it helps the person on the other side of the world, the activist, the person who's trying to, you know, save their country, trying to make change. 